only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 p.m. on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Hello there, it's six o'clock and I'm Michelle Jubry. Coming up tonight is the end, finally, in sight. I'm speaking, of course, about the Rwanda plan. Have you lost the will to live when it comes to all this? Do you still back it? Did you ever back it? Will it ever actually finally become law or not? And good news, inflation falls again. So do you reckon we've teared a corner? Do you think it's going to help the Tories after all? And do you actually feel better off? And do you think now it's time for an interest rate cut? Or not. And get this, nearly three million people in this country are on long-term sick leave. Many of those people apparently is because of their mental health. When it comes to our welfare system, uh, do you think all of this is sustainable or not? And let me ask you this, do you think you should be able to smack your child, your grandchild? It's unlawful in Scotland and Wales, but allowed in England and Northern Ireland if it constitutes reasonable punishments. Experts though now want, want that to be outlawed. Do you agree with them or not? Yes, expect some robust debate over the next hour. But before we get stuck in, let's cross live to Polly Middlehurst for tonight's six o'clock news. Michelle, thank you and good evening to you. Well, the top story tonight from the GB newsroom is that MPs have rejected all amendments to the government's Rwanda bill suggested by the House of Lords. Let's show you live pictures of the upper chamber. Uh, the rejected legislation is back there and it's understood Labour peers will apparently back two of those amendments tonight if they pass. MPs will then consider them in the Commons this coming Monday. Full coverage of that, of course, right here at GP News. And the Prime Minister has put on record he's committed to getting flights off the ground to Rwanda by the end of the spring. Well, in other news today, Sir Keir Starmer has accused the Prime Minister of dodging questions over cutting NHS and pension funding to cover the cost of eventually scrapping national insurance. Speaking during Prime Minister's questions today, the Labour leader criticised the Conservatives for what he called their obsession with wild, unfunded tax cuts. Rishi Sunak fought back, though, telling the Commons it's always the same with Labour, he said. Higher taxes and working people paying the price. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister was hailing today's inflation figures, saying they demonstrated his economic plan is working. Figures show the rate of inflation is indeed down. It's fallen to its lowest level in two and a half years, in fact. That's down to 3.2% in March compared with 3.4% the month before. Economists are saying a dip in food prices is the main reason for that slowdown. We've been speaking to people in Market Bosworth in Leicestershire to hear what they thought about the drop in inflation. It's better than it going the other way, that's for sure. But I don't think it's going to make a massive difference to the man in the street. No, I haven't really noticed. I'm, um, I, with my shopping, I know exactly what I buy every week. So I know what my bills are every week. And at this point in time, I haven't seen them come down. It doesn't really make any difference. Perfect. It is what it is. If people want more increase in wages, things have got to go up. And I'm afraid they'll have to put up with it. 
Now, a 28-year-old man convicted of attempting to murder two elderly worshippers in mosques in what a judge described as a horrific attack has been sentenced to an indefinite hospital order. Mohammed Abkir, who has paranoid schizophrenia, threw petrol over his victims and set them alight outside mosques in both Birmingham and London. The court heard 82-year-old Hashi Adoa and 70-year-old Mohammed Rayaz were chosen at random because Abkir believed they were possessed by evil spirits. Mohammed Rayaz Jr. said his father's attacker should have been sent to prison to face the maximum sentence. Mohammed Abkir, who set my father on fire, he's not going to serve a prison sentence, but he's going to be going to a hospital, probably get served a three-course meal and have an evening cup of tea whereas he should be in a prison, you know, facing, you know, maximum, maximum punishment, especially setting two people on fire in two main cities of the United Kingdom. You're talking about London and Birmingham. I mean, how could this happen? Mohamed Raya speaking there. Sussex Police formally apologised today for serious failings in its investigation into the murders of two little girls in the 1980s. Nine-year-old Nicola Fellows and Karen Hadaway were sexually assaulted by paedophile Russell Bishop in Woodland near Brighton in 1986. The attacker was acquitted at the end of his first trial a year later due to legal weaknesses in the case as well as lies told by the paedophile's ex-girlfriend. Meanwhile, paedophiles convicted of serious sexual offences could lose their parental rights. A proposed law would stop offenders being able to decide where their children go to school, for example, as well as important health and travel choices for their children. Only the most serious sexual offence, rape of a child under 13, is going to be covered under that new rule. But Labour's MP Harriet Harman says the rule could be extended to cover less serious sexual offences against children in future. Now, the boss of the post office has been exonerated following an independent investigation into allegations of bullying. Nick Reed always rejected claims of misconduct. The firm says he has its full backing now to lead the organisation, which continues to fall under the spotlight over the Horizon IT scandal, during which hundreds of sub-postmasters were wrongly convicted of theft. And just one note of international news to bring you up to date with concerning the Israeli Prime Minister. He's been speaking with our Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, uh, and he has said in no uncertain terms Israel will be making its own decisions, he said, about how it's going to defend itself as global leaders pleaded for restraint over how Israel will be responding to those Iranian drone and missile attacks over the weekend. David Cameron speaking with Benjamin Netanyahu, saying more and... Uh, definitely different actions could be taken to sanction Tehran. Rishi Sunak, of course, don't forget, speaking to his Israeli counterpart last night, saying any significant escalation is in no-one's interest and would only deepen insecurity in the region. We're following that story for you, of course, all the time on GB News throughout the evening. That's the news for the latest stories. Sign up to GB News Alerts. Scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Thanks for that, Polly. I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm keeping you company till 7 o'clock tonight alongside me my panel. I've got Quentin Letts, the parliamentary sketchwriter for the Daily Mail, and Aaron Bastani, the co-founder of Novara Media. Good evening to both evening. of you. Yeah. And you know the drill, don't you? It's not just about us three. It is about you at home as well. What's on your mind tonight? You can get in touch with me all the usual ways. You can tweet me or X me. Um, if you're down with the kids, you can also go online to our website. There's our new snazzyway gbnews.com slash your say um i've already been chatting to some of you on there tonight but you're very welcome and don't worry if that's not your kind of thing you can still email me as well on the usual address all of your views are very welcome tonight um also aaron i'm pleased to have you because it was a big night in football last night for it portsmouth wasn't it it was it is yeah it was um i live in portsmouth and Till the early hours, you could hear them stream past our front door, shouting "Blue Army, play I'm up Pompey." I'm surprised you wasn't there with your shirt over your head, I'm, doing I'm, your chants. I'm from Bournemouth, from Bournemouth. Swinging your beers around. No, no. Did anyone see that? There was a huge pitch invasion <laughs> last night. Um, congratulations to anyone. It, it means uh, so much. That city is an extraordinary city, and its relationship to the football club is very unusual. Yeah, it's.
it's very good actually. Um, although when I was mentioning that I was going to do this tonight, um, people were saying, make sure you point out they shouldn't have been doing a pitch invasion. I mean, come Why off not? it. If you've just been uh, promoted like that, you're going to be up to it. Uh, you're going to be celebrating. There'll be a few sore heads, I can tell you right now, in Portsmouth tonight. You're a massive uh, football fan, Quentin? I, I quite like football. Her Hereford FC. But my friend Robert Hardman, the royal biographer, he's a tremendous Portsmouth fan. Uh, so uh, um, he'll be... He's more excited than Portsmouth than he is about King Charles. About is he that? really? Well, um, are you in Barnsley? <laughs> are you in Barnsley tonight? You perhaps uh, won't be feeling uh, very, gr very good, should I say, about uh, matters tonight. Uh, also, I'll tell you what you might not be feeling very great about, the Rwanda situation. You know, this is one of those things because many people will have very strong opinions on the channel uh, crossings and the situation there, but I wonder, when you hear this word now, the, the Rwanda... Uh, where the Rwanda plan, what do you do? Because I used to be kind of in there, I used to think, yeah, do you know what, it's going to be a deterrent. But as it kind of months, weeks, years now actually have rumbled on, it's just become a bit of a farce now, hasn't it? Uh, don't forget it was Pretty Patel, she first uh, announced this, and it was literally, I'm not even exaggerating, about two years ago now. Uh, we've been toing and froing with this uh, in Parliament in just a second. I shall be crossing live to our political editor, Christopher Hope. He's going to bring us up to speed with all the twists and turns, but you... Quentin Letts, you've been there today, haven't you, watching the goings-on in Parliament? Uh, yes, but there was very little of it. Uh, uh, I was doing PMQs, but it's only... It's now in the point where it's, it's, it's very quick ping-pong. Ping-ponging. So they're not really uh, having long discussions about it. They're just having votes. Then it goes to the House of Lords. The House of Lords wake up and say, uh, where's my bovril? Oh, yeah, we're discussing that. And then they vote, and then they're, they're, being, they're still being obstructive. Just give and, me an um, insight, or give the viewers an insight, if you will. Uh, you know, you're kind of mixing uh, with the hoi polloi, all of these MPs, day in, day out. I what's try to people, avoid them. What, what's people's <laughs> sentiment about this Rwanda thing? Is the energy there, the motivation there, or are people just a bit past it, or what? Well, I think there's quite a lot of what you said earlier. People were very excited. A, a lot of us were quite, you know, on the right, were, were thought it was really good idea at the start. But that enthusiasm has been tempered by the establishment gumming up the works. And it's been an amazing uh, sustained act of, uh, of obstreperousness uh, well, by the elite. Let's cross that live then, shall we, uh, to our political editor. He is uh, in Westminster now, Christopher Hope. Christopher, for anyone who hasn't followed the goings-on uh, over the last kind of 48 hours well, or so, just bring everyone up to speed as to where we are tonight, please. Good evening, Michelle, and hi, Quentin, and the panel. That's right, I'm here in, in historic uh, Westminster Hall, where, where forever this is how, how p parliaments have passed uh, laws. The House of Commons, the elected Commons, vote through measures. The House of Lords tries to get the Commons to think again, and there's a battle between the two over who will win. And in this case, it's the safety of Rwanda bill. This bill is meant to ensure that people who arrive here illegally can be flown to Rwanda, where they'll stay. And the idea of that threat is meant to break the business model um, of, of these people traffickers from France. That's the idea. Now, um, members of the House of Lords have tried to make changes to, the, to this bill, which uh, the government thinks might weaken it and allow uh, lawyers to get their claws into it and find loopholes to stop anyone being flown uh, to Rwanda. Now, there are four amendments um, that have been going backwards and forwards between the Commons and, and the Lords. As things stand, the laws are due to start debating again uh, the four that have come back to them from the House of Commons today. I understand that two of those amendments, from Lords Hope and Lords Brown, one of them which will mean that people who, who were fought or served with UK forces in Afghanistan can't be flown to Rwanda. That's one of the amendments. The second one is Lord Hope. He wants um, some, some form of uh, official report every year to assert that Rwanda is a safe country. Those two measures, the Labour peers, are trying to get overturned again and sent back to the Commons. And no one quite knows now what the cross benches will do. If they support the Labour peers, then those two measures go back to the Commons probably on Monday. And the idea that this could be law by tomorrow, which the whips have been targeting for about a month now, is for the birds. We go into another week and it all starts again. So this is the nature of making laws in Parliament. It's like making sausages. You shouldn't look in too much detail about what's going on. Fascinating analogy there. I like it. Christopher, thank you. Um, I I'll, I'll won't get involved in my thoughts about sausages that is just now planted mm. in my head. I'll stick with Rwanda. Um, are we ever actually going to get to the end of this, Aaron? I don't think so. I mean, your own channel um, 
Earlier this month? No. Yes, earlier this month, reported that 70% of the homes on a particular site which had been gushed over by Suala Braverman had actually been sold. Uh, you have to presume that's because those in Rwanda, particularly Paul Kagame, the leader of that country, recognised this won't happen, and if it is on the statute books, it's hard to see it being implemented in any meaningful sense before the general election. I suppose the bet from the Conservative Party and their supporters will be, well, look, if we can just get several hundred people over there, symbolically that's a big win ahead of the next general election. We can show there's almost like a prototype of how we want to create this um, deterrent. That may be something of a game-changer, but I think if you end up with 20, 30 people over there, it's going to look kind of ridiculous. So if I was a betting person... I would say they probably will get some people over there, but not enough for it to make a real political difference. I think they will. There's tremendous sort of, um, shallow political games going on here. There was talk earlier today that Rishi Sunak was maybe going to do a press conference tomorrow or the following day. The Labour Party now wants to try to stop the Prime Minister having his little press conference, so that's part of what's going on here. And there's another game going on, which is that the Labour Party is understood to be keen to throw up a political story which would obscure the Angela Rayner story, which is gaining legs at the moment. Mm -hmm. So there, there's some sort of... Those are some of the political shenanigans there. But the really strikes me as, as, as a, a very discreditable thing here is that the House of Lords, it strikes me, is basically helping the people smugglers. And that, to me, is a bad look for the House of Lords. And it makes uh, some people, I would include myself in this, uh, think, let's, uh, let's get rid of the House of Lords. And Keir Starmer, so Keir Starmer was going to get rid of the House of Lords, but I think he may have changed his view now. Um, I was at an airport the other day, queuing in a very long queue for passport control, and all the Border Force people were stood there, massive queue. And I just thought, this is all a little bit of a farce, really, because you're checking all of our documents, seeing who's coming in and whatever. Whereas, actually, people can just get on these dinghies, enter the country illegally. No-one has a clue who they are. Half of them get rid of... Maybe not half, but lots of them get rid of their documents. And it made me quite angry, actually, because I thought that what's happening now is a dereliction of duty from the government. I think that one of your primary responsibilities as the government is to keep uh, your civilians safe and also enforce your borders, protect your borders. And when you've got a situation now where you've got, I think it's 6,000-odd people this year alone, nearly 30% up on this point last year, mm. It's out of control. £15 million pounds a day now <coughs> being spent housing these people in hotels. That £8 million a day figure, by the way, long gone, everyone. Well, that's why they're trying to do this bill. Yeah, no, but this bill, you see, I used to think, yeah, this is a deterrent. No, I think that the ship has sailed, pardon the pun. What I think needs to happen now is a national emergency needs to be called... This is a national emergency. I think that you need to enlist the military to protect the borders. Well, they it... tried that. Uh, uh, but I, I, well, who I, tried I, it? I think it, would still, I think it will still be a deterrent. Who tried it? The, 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 I mean, the armed forces were involved at some point and then decided... But don't that you think actually, this is a know... national emergency now? I agree, but I think it's day. absolutely disgraceful, but uh, I still think it will be a deterrent. Do you? Yes. See, I was in your camp... But I'm not anymore because I just think. Well, it's gone understandably, too far. you have become uh, dismayed by the gumming up uh, by the House of Lords people uh, playing their games. I mean, it's it's a really irritating and frustrating business. I'm more than dismayed. I'm pretty damn disgusted, actually. Yeah, yeah, that no, people I agree can with you. breach the border repeatedly in this way and then, at the cost of the taxpayers, be put up in hotels and all the rest Michelle, of it. Michelle, we are so as one. I think, I, I suspect I won't be as one with you, Aaron, because I think it's time to consider genuinely pushing back these boats, making it absolutely rock-solid clear you will not cross into this water. It's not going to happen. Well, I think the issue of the European Convention on Human Rights comes back there. Um, and, again, it goes back to the fact that the Conservatives... Um, repeatedly, over various leaderships... You don't have a right to illegally breach a border... Well, no, but I'm saying there are certain conventions and treaties that we've signed up to, and, of course, you can make the argument we should leave them. Some people are making that argument. But I think where there's been um, misrepresentation and distortion from the Conservative side is they've said we can action a certain kind of policy with regards to refugees, which quite simply isn't possible if you're in the ECHR. I imagine it's probably not possible if you have the Supreme Court. 
But for some reason, we've had many, many years of consecutive Home Secretaries pretending otherwise. I suspect because getting rid of the Supreme Court, that venerable institution first established in 2009, <laughs> yeah. um, I suspect because getting rid of that and, and, and moving around with various treaties and whatnot will be very hard work. And if you want to get on the multinational gravy train of the IMF, the WTO, OECD, Davos, after you leave office, you won't be very popular. So I, I think there has been a lack of honesty on the behalf of the Conservative Party for a very long time towards their voters about precisely what it would take to do some of the things you're, you're talking about. Yeah, I believe that all uh, countries have the right to protect their borders. It's a basic right for the countries. What I think there is now is an absolute lack of political will to actually have the chops either to explore this properly uh, or to start putting steps in place to the move towards that direction. The judges don't agree with you, Michelle. The Which judges, judges? Have, uh, uh, are not in your camp. Well, I bet some of them would be. Has this ever, uh, been, has this ever, been, has this ever been put? They won't be. Has no. this ever been put? Because I actually don't... And maybe I'm wrong, and you will be knowledge, more knowledgeable, perhaps, uh, than what I am, but has this uh, ever been put forward and say, right, you know what, this is what we're going to do. We are going to start defending... We're going to declare a national emergency. We're going to start defending our waters, our, Look, our boundaries, our borders, our territory. Look what the Supreme Court did to the last uh, Rwanda effort which was uh, passed by Parliament, and the Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that because we're going to take a United Nations opinion on the safety of Rwanda. Uh, what do you make to it all? Um, I think everybody, quite frankly, uh, seems to be losing the plot on this issue, and the government has certainly lost control. This will cause them uh, huge problems at the next ballot box, I suspect, uh, irrespective of whether or not a plane happens to uh, land in Rwanda or not. But where are you on the issue? I want to know. Get in touch all the usual ways with me tonight. Lots that I want to talk to you about. Do you feel positive today uh, when you saw the inflation numbers? They've fallen uh, less, though, perhaps, than what was expected. Do you feel richer today or not? Also, we've got so many people now, millions, out of work, saying that their mental health is to blame. What do we do about this? See you in two. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. In every corner of the world, people celebrate English tradition and values as members of the Royal Society of St George. Yet here in England, branches are closing as membership dwindles. I feel that in this country, St George is all but dead and buried. Until recently, Stephen Warden from Wigston was president of the Leicestershire branch. Despite spending £1,500 of his own money advertising, he couldn't find enough members to keep it running. I did everything humanly possible to get new members into the branch from the local environment, but they were just not interested in joining. He thinks changing demographics and declining interest in the society's values contributed to disappearing membership. But he also blames political leadership at national and local levels. Stephen claims his proposal for a St George's Day parade was repeatedly rejected by Leicester City Council over 10 years. A celebration is planned for St George's Day, but like most cities and towns, no parade will pass through the streets. A Leicester City Council spokesperson said, Leicester's annual celebrations of St George's Day have been organised and funded by the City Council for many decades and they remain an important part of the city's festival calendar. Some in Leicester say they would like to see more done to celebrate England's patron saint. I think it's a sign of patriotism. I think it helps the country. We celebrate a lot of religious festivals here. People forget, I think, uh, what is important to England. Maybe it's been sort of um, jumped onto with the wrong crowd, but I think nowadays it's just completely different. Back in Wigston, St George's Cross flies above Stephen's home. It makes me feel good because I know at least I've not forgotten St George if everybody else has. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 
Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, I'm Michelle Jupiter with you. Until 7 o'clock tonight, Quentin Letts, the parliamentary sketch writer for the Daily Mail, alongside me, as is Aaron Bastani, the co founder of Navara Media. Welcome back, everybody. Um, what a waste of parliamentary time, uh, says Michael. There's so many other things that our uh, members should be discussing. Of course, he's referencing then the Rwanda uh, plan that's going through ping pong at the moment. Uh, dysfunctional, says John. Uh, Trish as everything this government does is a farce. Matt says uh, Rwanda is only a deterrent if you can send thousands a year. Otherwise, it is simply a gimmick, he says. I've got to say that. I think many people will agree with that. But let me know your thoughts on that Rwanda plan. Keep them coming in all the usual ways. Philip says, Michelle, uh, can you still see our emails? Yes. Philip, I most certainly can. Whatever floats your boat, you can get in touch with me. That way, your views are very welcome. But, of course, inflation. Uh, we got the news today. It's fallen. It was 3.4%. It's now fallen to 3.2%. Were there, Tiger, some people will say, because it was predicted and expected to fall to 3.1%. But that didn't happen. Uh, anyway, though, we are kind of going in the, the direction. The direction feels like it's the right one. Rishi Sunak said that he would half inflation. He's ticked that box and then some. Um, do you think that we're, we're in a, a good position right now with all this or not, Quentin? Well, I think it could be worse, but I'd like to uh, see inflation lower. And the thing that strikes me is that petrol prices seem to be going up again, and uh, that seems to be um, uh, perhaps linked to what's going on in the Middle East. Mm. The, uh, uh, our economy is just uh, a very small, small fry compared to the, 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 the general Western economy, which is influenced by... It's affected by... Um, the th things like closing off um, well, shipping difficulties in, in the Middle East. And uh, the, the oil, the whole oil price uh, is affected by Middle Eastern crisis. Of course, of course. So that, those sort of things are... Uh, not very helpful at the moment. Well, this is why when we were talking about the whole situation, when people were talking um, about Israel and asking them to show restraint <laughs> or whatever when it comes to responding to what Iran did, and we did a whole piece on this, mm. uh, and a few people getting in touch, they oh, Michelle, you know, focus on UK matters. Yeah. And I was trying to say, believe you me, mm. what happens in the Middle East will absolutely affect yeah. people here in the UK. Whatever they think to that conflict and whatever side they're on, irrelevant. Mm. Uh, even just economically, it will mm. affect people. That's absolutely right. Well, look at the early 1970s. You have a conflict involving Israel. Um, you have a subsequent embargo of oil by the OPEC countries, primarily in West Asia, towards Europe. You see a massive price rise with regards to oil, massive runaway inflation. You cannot imagine a world of Margaret Thatcher and the turn against the Keynesian state, as we like to call it, of the 50s, the 60s, the early 70s. That doesn't happen, certainly not in that way without the oil crisis of the early 70s. So oil prices are fundamental. Mm. And the idea that, oh, this doesn't matter with regards to Iran, Iran's doctrine of self-defence, if the proverbial really hits the fan, is to close down the Arabian Sea, the Red Sea, and the Strait of Hormuz. Mm. And you're looking at around 35 40% of globally traded oil, if that happens. You would see a price spike, I think, probably quite similar to the early 1970s. Now, that's highly unlikely... But it is probably important context for people when they say, oh, we should just care about here at home because there are big, big implications with regards to what happens in the Middle East for us here in the UK. Do you, yeah, I mean, do you share this view? We've just been in the I news do. headlines as well. We've just seen Cameron there with um, Netanyahu. Oh, those, you, those, those pictures were glorious. I was just about to uh, say, you made a comment to me yeah. which the viewers weren't have been able to hear because we were listening uh, diligently to Polly instead. What were you saying? Well, you, so the, the photographs showed um, uh, Mr Cameron, Lord Cameron, rather, bouncing up and down in his chair, trying to engage uh, Benjamin Netanyahu in conversation, and Netanyahu looking daggers at our foreign secretary. I get the impression, I think I'm right about this, is that the Israeli Prime Minister thinks that our Foreign Secretary is a grade one turkey and um, has no time for him at all. And uh, Lord Cameron's been pushing some quite, uh, quite a sort of um, a surprisingly uh, Israeli sceptic line uh, from, from the government recently. Sunak seems much more keen on Europe, uh, on, on Israel, than, um, 
than Cameron does. And uh, I just don't think Netanyahu and Cameron are made for each other. I think they should be kept as well, far apart from the butter knives as possible. Do, do you think that's fair? Netanyahu's um, position, or actually Cameron's uh, view of being potentially anti-Israeli? Anti-Israel is a strong is a strong term. I agree. I agree with what Quentin said. I think it's far more it's far more critical of Israel than perhaps one might have anticipated. He's probably led the way more than Keir Starmer has. I think he has said certain things, and actually in the slipstream of, of Cameron and Biden, Starmer's followed. You would have thought, given their respective electoral coalitions, Starmer would say something which is actually leading the way with regards to Cameron. That's not been the case. So I think that's right. However, you know, there was that story in the FT that the Israelis wouldn't have time to speak to our people. And I think, look, you have the Royal Air Force um, bringing down ballistic missiles, bringing down Iranian drones, that cost the taxpayer in this country money. Mm. We lost three of our people, our aid, aid workers in Gaza, killed accidentally, that's what the IDF said. That's not, it's not fine, but they've given an explanation. I think, frankly, we should have done more in response, but OK. Given all that, I find it utterly remarkable that Netanyahu can say, sorry, I haven't got time. Because without the US Air Force, without <clears> the Royal Air Force, that attack by Iran on Israel would have looked fundamentally different. But do you, has there actually, speaking of those aid workers, um, those British ones, has there been an independent inquiry as to what went on there or just the Israeli inquiry? Here's the remarkable thing. <coughs> I mean, isn't it crazy? You lose three of your people, three ex-service personnel, and they say, investigate yourselves. Mm. There was also a Pole, an Australian and a US-Canadian dual national that were killed, as well as a Palestinian. As I understand it, the only independent investigation thus far is by the Polish government or the Solicitor General into the death of the Polish national. I don't understand for the life of me why we can't do something similar in this country. But there you are. I thought it was a bit odd, that well, response to this. It only happened very recently. Um, so uh, I think, you know, one might be... Uh, you've got to remember as well that the, is, the Israelis are feeling... Though they are. Uh, they're in a war and they're fighting for their country. And sometimes we've got to put ourselves in that position. If we were in the position where we had had 300 Iranian uh, missiles being fired at us. Now, uh, uh, we might not take very kindly to people from the Labour Party of another state uh, saying that we shouldn't be defending ourselves. So uh, I, I, I'm very sympathetic to... I'm trying to be sympathetic to all sides in this. But um, I think the Israelis, you've got to bear in mind, that they are they're fighting for their country at the moment. Um, let me bring it back to uh, UK inflation then, because Rishi Sunak, of course, he made this one of his pledges, as we've just been saying. But I just wonder, how much, um, how much is this due to the efforts of Rishi Sunak, mm. this kind of fall in inflation? And yes, by the way, at home, you'll say, Michelle, you know, inflation falling doesn't mean that everything's getting cheaper, it just means that they're, li they're rising less fast. I know that. Um, but how much of this is to Sunak's credit? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? When inflation skyrockets, the government says, we can't do anything, it's the Bank of England which is yeah. responsible for interest rates and inflation. And when it's a good news story, it's all us. Um, I mean, partly it's because of the government, partly it's because of the Bank of England, but fundamentally, the inflation that we were seeing 18, mo 18 months ago, two years ago, was fundamentally because of issues beyond their control, primarily um, energy prices. Those have come down. So, somewhat, they, they didn't make the problem worse, and that's, that's, OK, that's OK, that's a good thing. Politicians often do that. Um, but, yeah, they shouldn't be taking the whole, uh, the whole plaudits by any means. I think you can give them credit for a general sense of economic stability and for the public sector pay, uh, keeping, keeping uh, those pay settlements a bit lower than the public sector wanted. Mm. So I think that that... But the Bank of England, actually, the Bank of England's a pretty ropey place at the moment and the governor is, is, a, is a loose tooth. Do you think that the Bank of England should cut uh, the base rate, then? Uh, yes, I do, although it is uh, looking a little less likely now that the inflation didn't go down quite as much, but I, I think they should have been much more optimistic. Yeah, it was, it was predicted to go uh, fall to 3.1%, uh, and actually it was 3.2%. But they so will seize... Not... I get the impression the Bank of England is, is eager to seize any opportunity to be pessimistic. Mm. Yeah, and I think there were predictions that, that, that there would be quite a few interest rate uh, cuts this year. Mm. I think people have very hastily kind of re-evaluated those predictions, predicting perhaps just one. Do you think the Bank of England has been a little bit too overcautious in this? And let's listen. We've just been talking about how much credit uh, Sunak, etc., should be given. Let's listen to what Rishi Sunak had to say today. Taxes have been cut by £900, state pensions gone up, free childcare has been expanded, wages have risen for nine months in a row, Mr Speaker, and just today, inflation down again to 3.2%. Our 
plan is working and the Conservatives are delivering a brighter future for Britain. Uh, let's listen then to what Rachel Reeves had to say in response. I think that the reasons for the falls in inflation are, are down to what's happening in, in some of the, the global markets. But the truth is that people are still worse off, uh, worse off after 14 years of Conservative government. And this will be the only parliament where living standards are lower at the end of the parliament than they were at the beginning. That is the legacy of 14 years of Conservative government. Nodding along then, Aaron Bastani. Mm, I'm not the biggest fan of Rachel Reeves. When she's right, she's right uh, on tax cuts. Yes, there were major cuts to national insurance, but if you earn less than £26,000, you've not seen a tax cut. If you earn more than £60,000, grand, you have not seen a tax cut. If you're a pensioner, you've not seen a tax cut, because, of course, they also move the thresholds around. Childcare is a good move. They should be commended for that. But the fundamental thing here, and it's a subtext to what Rachel Reeves just said, is interest rates. Mm. If you have remortgaged your home, as I had the misfortune of doing around the time of the Liz Trust Premiership... Oh, yeah, so did I. Cool. <laughs> and you are four or five hundred pounds worse off as a result purely on your mortgage plus energy plus food and do you blame it's the very hard do you blame the government specifically for your mortgage going up i think well i would certainly blame this trust if you know um i think we need to reassess interest rates and inflation in this country so right now inflation the target is two percent um, and we won't really see cuts to interest rates until it's around there. I think that's too much. I think in the medium term, that figure should be between 3 and 4%, because you're basically allowing for a long-term economic stagnation. I don't think that helps anybody. I think a, an interest rate cut right now, probably another one, would be a tonic. We're not going to... We'll maybe see one later this year. And, by the way, that's the number one reason why I think the Tories are really screwed. Do you, and you just said that your mortgage uh, went through the roof. Do you blame the government for that? Uh I blame Andrew Bailey a lot, actually. Well, the yeah. governor of the Bank of England was a re really unimpressive, dithery type. Mm. And uh, also an extremely boring man, but that's by the by. <laughs> uh, perhaps you want the governor of the Bank of England to be boring, but my goodness, he wins prizes at it. But he doesn't radiate any sort of control or vision or um, belief in our country. And, uh, and I blame him. I mean, Liz Truss... I think the, the blame of her for her has been possibly slightly overdone, I don't know. Yeah, I think she became a very uh, convenient scapegoat, Liz Truss, isn't she? Um, Lee says, Michelle, prices are still rising and many people are suffering. It wasn't, Rishi, uh, that's got inflation down. It's nothing to do with the Tories. But did you think it was anything to do with the Tories when inflation was going up, though, Lee? Tell me uh, your thoughts on that. Uh, Les says, we'll never uh, get inflation down to a completely low level if wages keep increasing, because then we go round in a wage price spiral, uh, so says Les. Andrew says, Michelle, you are being very flippant about the topic of mental health, and I wish that you weren't so. He's referring to the um, topic that's coming up after the break. Millions of people now are on long-term sick in this country, many of those, uh, because of mental health issues. I am certainly not flippant about mental health, I assure you of that. But how? What do we do? How do we have a welfare system that can support this? Should it be supporting that? Or not, tell me. I'll see you in two. Time for your latest weather update from the Met Office here on GB News. Good evening. Temperatures dropping away tonight. It's going to be a cold start tomorrow. Much of the south will stay fine, but further north, some rain and cloud moving in, thanks to this little area of low pressure that's drifting south. Ahead of that, we've had a couple of weather fronts bringing some rain today, particularly for Northern Ireland. That's now spreading south across parts of Pembrokeshire, Devon and Cornwall, but clearing through this evening. Further showers across eastern England, they'll steadily fade as well. And where we've got the clear skies, southern Scotland, northwest England, Wales, a hint of blue on the chart, suggesting there will be a frost, certainly in the countryside. Most towns and cities just about staying above freezing, but certainly a, a chilly start to Thursday. For many, a bright, sunny start. There could be some showers early on across Kent. They should fade, but rain will creep into uh, the highlands of Scotland, the Western Isles first thing, and that'll spread across most of Scotland by lunchtime. Parts of the north and east of Northern Ireland seeing some rain, and through the afternoon, turning damp over Northern England and Northern 
North Wales. But much of the south will stay dry and bright. We could reach 15 in London, a brighter day across East Anglia. Cooler further north with the winds picking up and those brisk winds, then a feature of the weather on Friday as well. Friday, broadly speaking, a mixture of sunshine and showers, a duller day across the southeast and a, a much wetter day across East Anglia compared to tomorrow. Feeling chilly again with that wind, much of Northern Ireland, Scotland having a drier day, uh, but still on the fresh side, 8 to 14 degrees. The latest GB News travel. Good evening, I'm Johnny Ratner with the latest long queue through North Yorkshire. The A170 remains closed just east of Pickering, near to the Fornton Road Industrial Estate for accident investigation work. On the M53 in Cheshire, one lane shut southbound junction 10 to 11 towards the M56 for emergency repairs. Queues as well on all approaches. In Nottinghamshire, the M1 is blocked southbound junction 27 to 26 towards Nottingham after two lorries collided with a car, causing long queues back to the tip shelf services. And meanwhile in Warwickshire on the M6 southbound, the outside lane shut, junction 3 to 2 near Coventry after a van and a car collided, blocking off the outside lane. And finally, if you're heading for the underground in London, Metropolitan Line trains are suspended out of Wembley Park to Aldgate. It's problems with the signals at Neasden and TfL are telling us. And that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Hello, welcome back. I'm Michelle Jubri alongside me, Quentin Letts, and our Bastani remain. Um, before the end of the programme, I want to ask you, do you think you should be able to smack your own children or your grandchildren, children that you're caring for? You're not allowed um, in England and Northern Ireland, but experts want to change that, so I'll come on to that in a few minutes. But before I get there, um, I want to talk about a report in the Daily Mail today. It was highlighting what they call Britain's worklessness crisis. Um, they'd interviewed a load of men, basically, that said, essentially, I'm paraphrasing, you can read it all on their website if you're interested. But it was basically them saying that they wasn't really worth their while going to work. Apparently, there's about 10 million people of working age that are economically inactive. Uh, at this moment in time, about 3 million of those are on long-term sick leave. And it caught my eye. There's quite a lot of those people as well uh, that are off with mental health issues. Now, this whole issue of um, worklessness, I want to have to resolve it, Aaron. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's, it's a huge conversation, a huge conversation. I, I, the first thing I'd want to say is that sometimes the figures aren't especially revealing. So 9.4 million people of working age are economically inactive. Mm -hmm. uh, but that does include a significant number of students. It includes people that retire Retired. early, yeah. stay-at-home mums. They might have a child yeah. and they say, you know what, I, can't, I don't want to pay the nursery fees. We can afford it. Mm -hmm. um, or actually, financially, doesn't make any sense. I will stay at home for a couple of years. That's lots of people. Um, However, there are, of course, still many people after that who are on long-term sick leave, and increasingly that is people with mental health issues. I've had depression in the past. I've had anxiety in the past. They were debilitating. They were awful. But one thing that really struck me was how hard it was to get effective treatment from the NHS. It took me three GPs to actually get a proper assessment of what the issue was. I didn't even know I had depression. Um, and it was only because my wife said, I have a great doctor, go see him. And I wonder how much of this could be nipped in the bud if we were spending a tiny portion of this on better mental health services. I don't mean long-term care, although that's probably a part of it too, but just right at the start, when people feel that they've lost their emotional resilience, they're feeling down, they can't quite explain why, a trip, that trip to the doctor and just trying to work out what the issue is makes all the difference. And I feel like we're operating, as is so often the case in this country, a bit of a false economy. And actually, the savings from effectively identifying and treating this stuff early on is a game changer. Quentin, your thoughts? I think a lot of people are uh, taking the mick, actually. A lot of these uh, people who are refusing to work. And uh, the piece in the mail, very good piece uh, by Leo McKinstry and Inaya Falaran Iman uh, today. Really interesting. And it's showing that um, mental health is becoming almost a fashionable. 
uh, thing. Uh, that's the way it seems to be. And that the money that they are getting, these people, for not working is better than the old age pension. And you just think, hang on, it, this is, a, this is a, a, an incentive not to work that the state is offering. And what's really bad about this, if you are going to swallow that they are really, truly suffering from mental ill health, the, 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 the paradox here is that the greatest treatment for mental ill health is work. If you have a job, you're much more likely to be happy and level and have some emotional resilience. If you're out of work, you're more likely to be depressed. So this is a, a terrible vortex that we're getting ourselves into by paying too much in benefits. Do you, do you agree with that? So there's a few things. I think rates of mental ill health have gone up for very real reasons. The housing crisis, I think mobile phones have something to do with it. I think social isolation. We had far stronger communities 30, 40, 50 years ago. That's a very real difference. Where I do agree is I would say those are real triggers for this. And then not being in work, <laughs> being further isolated, I think can exacerbate the problem. I feel that the millions of people who are in this situation, many of them have issues which obviously mean they cannot work. But it's almost like the best help they could get would be a state guarantee of job, um, a job when guarantee, you say a, you can't a, a, work. a significant job, not but, some Mickey Mouse job. When you say you can't work, I mean, to say that an, an individual literally cannot work, any kind of work in the land, it cannot happen, I think that was a very small number of people, because, sure, if someone's got, I don't know, let's just say, uh, a physical disability... Or psychosis or something a, like this. You know, they that's... can't be a bricklayer or whatever. Yeah. But the, the world of work now is so expansive, so broad, so mm. diverse. Mm. Uh, it's so remote as well, so you can work wherever now, yeah. for whatever, doing whatever. So I just find it quite difficult to believe that millions and millions of people can't do any form I, of work I, I, at I all. don't think that. I mean, I don't think millions and millions of people because of mental health can't work. What I would say is, though, they're being let down. And I feel that, actually, rather than politicians and people in the media... I don't mean us, of course, we're all wonderful. Um, you know, bashing them. I think we need some moral and political leadership in this country. Aaron, I mean, I just don't think they are being bashed. No, but I, uh, but I, don't, I just don't, and I think... That you just said there was pulling a fast one. No, but no, I'm, I'm, and, I, and I will get all sorts of grief for, for, for that, because you never hear that sort of uh, language from politicians, even though they might think it, because they have been backed into a corner of all having to be, oh, we've got to be very concerned about mental health. I think it's become a, a terribly soft political option to say, oh, uh, we've got a mental health crisis. I don't think we have. I think we've got a, uh, um, an application crisis. I, can I quickly say, I think housing and not having a well-paid job are the two mm. big triggers. And I think if we can sort those out, particularly housing... You know, the reason why I got depression was because my mum died, but it also had something to do with the fact that I moved 15 times in 15 years cos rent kept on going up. That, that is a huge... Thing. Your, your mobile's point is very, very And it has changed. Well. The internet is, mm. is very... But I'm going to say something, and it's not aimed at you, because I don't know your personal circumstances. Go on. You can be as, as, as nasty as you want. I'm not going to be nasty, I respect you, but when you say, oh, I got depression because my mum died... Yeah. If your mum dies, assuming you get on with your mum or whatever... Yeah. You're going to be absolutely devastated. Yeah. It's going to rip the yeah. foundation out of your life and mm. your heart and mm. your soul. Mm. But that's not a medical issue, that's a normal emotion. Sure, and, and I, I, I wonder whether or not we are medicalising yeah. normal emotions. Yeah. So I basically lost, over a course of about five years, any emotional resilience, which is one of the sort of definitions of depression. Um, and that was the thing that put me over the edge. You're absolutely right. Life is full of trials and tribulations and nasty stuff happens and you've got to pick yourself up. And that isn't mental ill health. I agree with you, uh, but for me, what it took was a good doctor giving me some treatment for six months and I could help myself. And it was a game-changer. And then I come along and I put you alongside uh, oh, Quentin uh, uh, and the downward spiral <laughs> commences all over again. Uh, look, anyway, let me know your thoughts on it. Get in touch all the usual ways after the break. I want to talk to you about what some might think is a very sensitive topic, whether or not you should be able to smack your child. Should you? Tell me. Martin Daubney, weekdays from 3pm. This new hate crime bill on women's issues, you think this is the least funny April Fool's joke in history? 
Yeah, although the Scottish government and the Scottish police do seem to be trying to make a bit of a joke of it when, you know, their campaign Hate Hurts is fronted by a hate monster who's a sort of cuddly, bright red uh, Muppet style thing. And some of the things that Hamza Youssef said about it were from a, a soft play centre over the weekend. But yeah, it's really not a joke. It's not actually clever lawyers who know the wording of the law, who enforce the law. It's the police. And the police have basically not been trained on this at all. There's a two hour online training course they're meant to have done, and lots of them haven't already done it. And we know from the way that the police have been talking about it, that they're wildly overstretching what it might actually be to be, in particular, abusive, which is one of the words in the new law, and specifically on the issue of transgender identity to claim that just noticing the fact that there are two sexes and that sex can't change is meant to be hateful. That you know, Even after years of trying to study it, I can't understand why people hold this belief. But it's part and parcel of a pattern of legal measures that the Scottish government has either introduced or has sought to introduce. So it tried to introduce gender self-ID, but that was overruled by Westminster because it was out of the power of the devolved government. It's still attempting to bring in a conversion therapy law, which sounds nice but isn't nice. It actually criminalises proper ethical treatment of gender-confused youngsters. Uh, they're trying to say that uh, men who have certificates saying that their women count as women for a particular measure to do with public boards. And then this uh, hate crime law, which tries to make it really difficult for someone to talk in a factual, reality-based, clear, understandable way about all these measures. It all adds up to a sort of an authoritarian attempt to deny the fact that human beings are mammals and come in two sexes, and that recognising that matters for women's rights especially. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Hi there, I'm Michelle Juby with you till 7 o'clock tonight alongside me. Quentin Letts, the parliamentary sketch writer for the Daily Mail, and Aaron Bastani, the co-founder of Navara Media. I could have carried that conversation on about mental health for such a long time. We did, actually, in the break. It's such an important uh, subject, isn't it? Uh, but for time reasons, I do need to move on because uh, now uh, experts, child experts, are saying that parents uh, should be banned, essentially, from smacking their children. Now, just to be clear, uh, in England and Northern Ireland, it is legal uh, to smack your child in certain situations, but it's not uh, legal in the likes of Scotland and Wales. I'm going to cut st uh, straight to the chase. Child experts. That phrase annoys me. Well, it was me that called them that. I know, I know, I know, I know, but they call themselves that as well. To me, uh, child experts also include parents and grandparents. And uh, I don't like politicians and um, lawyers and the cops getting involved in this. I mean, obviously, if, if there's grievous bodily harm going on, OK, <laughs> let, let, the, uh, let the police get involved. But if it's to do with a, a child being given, a, given a, a, a smack on the bottom uh, after it's been naughty or after it's behaved dangerously to itself, then I think the parents are completely within their rights and, in fact, have a duty to admonish the child in a, in a way that the child is going to remember. I had... A, um, I've got three children. And uh, the, uh, a little boy at one point, he had, a, he, he was a, he had some problems. And uh, the door was open. We lived in London at that time. And he ran towards the street. And I grabbed him. I got him. And I smacked his bottom. And did he, he never, shock him? It shocked him. And, um, but partly, I confess, I, I, I smacked him because I myself was um, cross with myself for having left the door. Somebody left the door open, I can't remember. But also, I, I was scared. He'd almost of killed himself by running into the traffic. But he never did it again. And uh, therefore, I think there have to be times when you can make a child think, yikes, I better not do that again. Aaron? You know, I was, I was smacked black and blue by my mother. 
and my dad did it once in my entire life and it had far more impact when my dad did it precisely because he didn't resort to, mm. to physical violence. Uh, it's, it's a really tough one. What I would say is if, if people in child protection say it makes their job easier if you criminalise it because it means they can stop these awful stories which we sometimes talk about mm. from happening, Yeah. then I think there's a very strong case for it. And, of course, people will say, well, there'll be people like your father, Aaron, he just smacked you once, is that the end of the world? Most people who resort to smacking their child don't just do it once. Um, and so you want common sense to be used, but I, I, I can understand why somebody in child protection would say, look, we need a red line here to make the enforcement of child protection that bit easier. I yeah. can understand the reasoning. And the line is, um, the phrase is um, reasonable punishment. So that's what they would say when you're enable, when you're allowed actually to smack them. But one person's definitely... That's what we're allowed to do at the moment, isn't it? Yeah, in England. Yes. Yeah, in England and Northern Ireland, but, but not they're... in Scotland or Wales. In yeah. Scotland or Wales, you're not allowed to smack the child at all. And now there is this push for it to the, the child experts that we were talking about earlier want it to be made uh, more... We want England to be more like Scotland. Yeah, and I just... What do you think? Um, jo oh, George, you're a harsh, a harsh fella, George. You say, <laughs> never mind banning um, the smacking of children, it should be made compulsory. <laughs> Discipline uh, seems to have been lost from society, I think is your message there, uh, George. Uh, Richard says, um, no, um, a, sm a firm tap, but not a smack, is often necessary, just to emphasise a spoken word. Um, David, though, says, yes, if your child is behaving badly, is a last resort, um, you should smack your child. It's called discipline. Um, Henry says, if you feel ever that you want to smack your child, then you are doing something very, very wrong. Mm, that's quite rubbish. Interesting, interesting. <laughs> well, let me know your thoughts on that. And by the way, many of you are writing in saying that I'm very flippant on the subject of mental health. I assure you, anyone that knows anything about my background, uh, I've suffered with mental health issues massively. I wouldn't wish it on anybody, so I'm far from flippant, I can assure you. Uh, but anyway, we can perhaps have that expanded conversation and another day, but for now, Aaron, thank you very much for your company. Yeah. Quentin, let's thank you for Good yours job. too. And all of you have appreciated your company. Thank you very much, but don't go anywhere. Nigel Farage is up next. Nanite. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Time for your latest weather update from the Met Office here on GB News. Good evening. Temperatures dropping away tonight. It's going to be a cold start tomorrow. Much of the south will stay fine, but further north, some rain and cloud moving in, thanks to this little area of low pressure that's drifting south. Ahead of that, we've had a couple of weather fronts bringing some rain today, particularly for Northern Ireland. That's now spreading south across parts of Pembrokeshire, Devon and Cornwall, but clearing through this evening. Further showers across eastern England, they'll steadily fade as well. And where we've got the clear skies, southern Scotland, northwest England, Wales, a hint of blue on the chart, suggesting there will be a frost, certainly in the countryside. Most towns and cities just about staying above freezing, but certainly a, a chilly start to Thursday. For many, a bright, sunny start. There could be some showers early on across Kent. They should fade, but rain will creep into uh, the highlands of Scotland, the Western Isles first thing, and that'll spread across most of Scotland by lunchtime. Parts of the north and east of Northern Ireland seeing some rain, and through the afternoon, turning damp over Northern England and North Wales. But much of the south will stay dry and bright. We could reach 15 in London, a brighter day across East Anglia. Cooler further north with the winds picking up and those brisk winds, then a feature of the weather on Friday as well. Friday, broadly speaking, a mixture of sunshine and showers, a duller day across the southeast and a, a much wetter day across East Anglia compared to tomorrow. Feeling chilly again with that wind, much of Northern Ireland, Scotland having a drier day, uh, but still on the fresh side, 8 to 14 degrees. Looks like this.